Hello, I'm Jamie Tomey. Welcome to this week's Quarren Tour with Erin Kramer, brought to you by Artist Bookhouse. We hope you enjoy it. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's Evanston Bound Artist Talk and Quarren Tour. This week, we're joined by Erin Kramer coming at us from Crystal Lake, Illinois. Erin, how are you today? Hey, Jamie, I'm doing well. Uh, thanks a lot for being here virtually, everybody. Um, you're all welcome to come see me in person as soon as you can. As soon as things lift, we'll have you in yep. Evanston for real. Um, although we did have you in Evanston for real last week when we hung some work in a park here in Evanston that you created for our partnership with Ridgeville Park District here on south side of Evanston. Um, we were both wearing masks, everyone. We stayed six feet apart and we had a very hard time not hugging each other because Erin, I think I met you first when you took my class at Columbia um, when you were an undergrad, right? Yeah. It was senior seminar story and image and then you started in the, the graduate program. Can you tell us about your coming to paper making and your, your basic history of the world of book arts and how awesome. Wow. Okay. That's, that's pretty broad. <laughs> yes, you know, introduce yourself. Um, okay, sure. So I'm Erin. Um, and I've been doing paper making for officially, I think, 12 years so that's been a constant um i have an mfa from columbia college in book and paper and i've put together for the studio visit today just um really more recent images of what i've been up to for about the last two years mm -hmm. so um i work across a lot of different disciplines um it just depends on what i think the project calls for, like what medium, and also most importantly, what I think would be cool. So the last couple of years I've been working in paper, textiles, installation, and big group projects. And of course there's overlap between all four of those. Um, and Ken, the man behind the curtain, is my tech person. So if you could bring up my little business card, I think that's my first. I put together some slides, you guys. All right, awesome. Can everybody hear me? So this is my little business card that I made up um, with my website. Um, I'm gonna keep that name because this is like the craziest thing, right? When I was in high school in the 80s, pretty much, pretty much all of my friends were named Jennifer. There was like 38 of them in my class and there were no errands. And so now all of a sudden, there are four Aaron Kramers with a C. And they're all artists, so I have to keep that website forever. Um, but I haven't updated it, so ignore it. Um, and for now. And um, my Instagram is the one that I, up, I update a little more regularly. So um, right now our state's in lockdown pretty well. And where I'm at at the Dole is, is closed to the public, but I've been able to come to my studio and work which has been nice, but um, I also just want to say that I think it's important that nobody feels pressured in the world to be really productive right now, if you don't want to be like, honestly, either way is cool. I, mostly I've just been making a mess, which is good um, in my studio, but I feel like this is a really big, beautiful spiritual lesson that we're learning right now because the past doesn't really apply to what we're doing because everything's new and the future is so super unknown even tomorrow so i think this is really about being present right now yeah. um are you able to go you're able to go to your uh your studio pretty much yeah. every day even though it's close to the public you're still able yeah. to go. Yeah, so the um, the people who are, are renting here still have access. So basically we can get through the front door and up to our studio. So it's sort of like living in an apartment building, but I've really only seen three or four people here the whole time. But I'm very grateful to have this space to hang out in and work out some new art projects and open the windows and get some fresh air. 
this is where I am sitting right now. So um, I'm in the old Dell Mansion in Crystal Lake. I'm about 40 miles northwest of Chicago. And it's a really, it's a really awesome space. So if you can see the image that shows pretty, pretty much the whole building, um, that first part of it is the mansion that was finished about 1865. And then um, I'm sitting in the new part. So that's the long part. And that was finished in uh, 1920. So the mansion is still the mansion. They've renovated it on the bottom floor and they renovated um, the, the annex, the building part on the first floor. So it's like super fancy. And I put on there just a note because I knew I was going to forget to tell you guys. If you go to their website, you can take a virtual tour of the mansion if you're into that kind of thing. Um, they did a really great job. So you can click your mouse on different points and go around through all the rooms and all the different floors like you're a ghostie. And it's super fun. So I recommend that. And when we open, sorry, when we open back up, you can come visit. So is this a, this is a building that was um, renovated to make space for artists? Or can you tell us a little bit about how, sure. yeah, is it studio space for artists? Is it a performance space? What's, what's going on there? Sure. So um, the original Dell Mansion, they were not the pineapple people. Um, but that's still the mansion and it hasn't been renovated very much on the second or third floor or the tower so basically like the higher up you go like the more scary and haunted it is which is awesome and you can go all the way up to the tower um, on the picture on the right there's the little white window way at the top so you can go all the way up there and look around so all of that is big space that you can rent out if you want and it's open to the public so you can come visit and the bottom floor is a gallery and then on the addition that was put on by the Ringling family um, in like the 19 teens, and they are the circus people. Um, this served as the first country club in the area. So the bottom floor is a big ballroom they rent out for weddings, and it's also a big art gallery. And then the two floors above it, I'm on the third floor. Those are all art studios. And um, originally it was a hotel. So basically, we have artist studios made out of um, haunted hotel, which is awesome. Um, is can awesome. you can so so can I want show to us the next one. So oh, bananas sorry. and circus basically is where you work with bananas, but not bananas and circus. Yeah, exactly, and, and ghosts. Um, ghosts. So if you walk if you walk into my building, the picture on um, I believe it should be on your left with the staircase is the lobby, and. Then next to that is just the corner of the ballroom because I just wanted to show you how pretty it is. So that's the renovated part. And then if you go through the mansion, it gets scary and haunted the further up you go. So that's always a good idea. Um, if you show us the next slide, Ken, this is this is my studio. I, I walked around and just took pictures with my cell phone because I thought, well, the studio visit, um, people like to look around. So I want to give you that opportunity. Um, the table that you see is where I'm sitting now, and behind me is the futon, and it's important to have a futon because napping is part of my artistic process. And um, I also have a little tea station, so if you've come and see me, I have drinks and snacks. Um, the next slide, please. Napping is definitely important for Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You got to have a, um, a comfy chair, and you got to have an Amish pie safe because, you know, so this room that I'm sitting in, I kind of call my corner office. And then the room that you're looking at with the fridge, that used to be the bathroom and it's got Jack and Jill doors. So it opens from the room I'm sitting in to the next room. And they took out everything except the bathtub. So I put a platform there. So to reach the micro up, I have to, you might not to, have to, Jamie told me, but I have to like get up on a ladder because everything's like super tall. Right, but I can right. just like reach up. And for we those of us right. who don't know me in person, who haven't <laughs> me for except for on these foreign tours, I'm six feet tall, barefoot. That's her, the, her jokes. Again, we have silly <laughs> pants here today. We have we have silliness. Um, so it's cool for storage. And then the next slide, um, I have it organized as the paper making room. Wait a and minute. You have your own paper making studio in this haunted mansion. 
yeah, so that's why you should come over. Oh, there's and, your little critter. <laughs> and um, sorry, it's actually sorry. an oracle, but it's it works about the same sure. way. So I've got yeah, so I've got um, I've got a one pound beater, and the next slide I believe is still paper. Mr. Ken. Yeah. I love that. So do you have, is there a floor drain or are you doing things in containers while you're? No, I'm just using um, the five gallon buckets and the strainers and my sink. So. Do you try and keep the water down pretty I, much? I'm trying to calm down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because yeah. we're, remember we're things in small. Columbia, we had all the floor drains and I remember yeah. also being very messy there and having yeah. Um, lots and lots of fun splashing so we could, around. We, we could use power hoses on the floor and just squeegee the water to a drain. So that, that was awesome. I'm, I'm right. trying to convince them to do that here, but they don't think I'm serious for some are reason. You, what floor are you on there? I'm on the third floor. You're on the third floor. So it would be yeah. hard to do a drain system that way, especially if you- But we can do hard things. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and then the next slide, is my sewing room. So as I was taking pictures, I was also trying to link them up so you can get an idea that I'm sort of spinning around the room. So I have this set up that if I have students up here or if I'm doing a large paper production, I can spill out into the sewing room really easily. Um, the tables also work for paper making, but I can also go the other way if I decide I really want to make a 20 foot quilt or something. I can put all my tables together and spill out into the paper room. So even though I have them separated, they, they can still work together pretty well if I need them to. It's like a movable feast. Yeah, a movable feast. I like that. And um, I like things to be soft and mellow and earthy so i keep my art supplies in my little baskets and yeah it looks really cozy and lovely <laughs> like you would want to actually spend loads of time there during a quarantine so yeah. i'm glad that yeah. you're able to, to be there now and to show us space virtually and to make work so uh what are and, you um, what have you been the working? next i think the next slide is my um singing balcony yeah. <gasps> So this is on the third floor. This balcony is right outside my studio door. So I can go out onto the balcony and sing a vita to the people. I am so jealous of that singing balcony. And I want to see videos of that on your Instagram. Do an Instagram live video of you singing a vita. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Right now. There, there, there might be some, uh, some critters appearing there soon. OK, so um, the next slide, I believe, is the wild geese mandalas that you were talking about. Yeah, and these are your pictures, Jamie, so yeah. thanks for that. So this was what we hung last week, right? Did, was it just last mm -hmm. week or was it two weeks ago? Yeah, no, it was just last week. So like, I never see you and now I see you all the time. So that's pretty awesome. I know, we get to hang virtually and socially distanced in person. So talk, <laughs> talk through this. We get to wave at each other. from Right, so this is an Artist okay. Bookhouse sponsored, sort of sponsored project. We asked you to, to yeah. make something to hang in a park and we got permission. Um, the entire city of Evanston is being an art gallery right now across the entire city since the beginning of May. There's an initiative called Evanston Art Connects and people are encouraged to hang art. We hung there's a lot of things going on last weekend. They had a scavenger hunt. There's an artist tour map on the evanstonmade.org website that walks people through the what's going on. There are pictures everywhere all over Instagram. And so we asked a couple of artists to make things that could be hung outside in a park because we connected with the Ridgeville Park District um, here in South Evanston. And they graciously gave us permission to hang things in the park. So um, Aaron was gonna hang something on a fire truck playground thing. And then all of a sudden I get this text, I wanna do this. And she walked <laughs> me through this idea. So can you tell people what yeah. these are and what they are from and inspired by? Yeah. I was gonna do something 
silly and whimsical at first because basically when my friends ask me if I want to do an art thing, I'm like, well, yes, of course. Um, and this was sort of a project that I had in the back of my head that was coming together pretty quickly. Um, my friend gave me some uh, timpani drum heads that are super awesome and they're four different sizes. So the biggest one is I think 33 inches and then they go down by three inches each. And I was like, oh, these would be really cool to make mandalas. And the quilt that I'm working on right now has a lot of flying geese in it. So I'm like, well, I want to make big flying geese. And then I'm like, yeah. And what I really want to do, because making the mandalas, I feel like, turns the park into sacred space. Um, I really wanted to tie that into the Mary Oliver poem, Wild Geese. So that's the whole thing. So um, I love... I love the, that you thought about making the park a sacred space. That is so beautiful, yeah. especially right now when the kids aren't allowed to play on the equipment. We can go in the parks with masks on and there's a huge field in this park that these mandalas kind of overlook, I guess is what I should say. Um, so I love that, that's so lovely. And um, Andy says, yep, that's the beauty of your decision making process. You don't know what wonderful goodness is going to come out next when Aaron Kramer is involved. And that is true. Ah, I was also really happy to do this because it, it helped me reach my, um, my yearly artistic goals are actually very simple, but they're really important to me. So in addition to making art, I also am an, an art educator. Um, so what I, what I put out in the world every year is I, my, my goals are to, to teach something to someone and also to be a student, to learn something new and make a new installation, which is what this is. Um, make a new installation or a body of work and get it out there in the world somewhere and um, work on some kind of group project with my friends. Um, I really love working collaboratively also so um, this was a really great opportunity to get an installation out that I think is important and and also whimsical um, right before this I had the keys to the kingdom installation so this was the first incarnation and this was from October and it was part of terrain which is the big outdoor public art exhibit that started in Oak Park with Sabina Ott she's the mother of it and this is and actually added, right all over and it's happening yeah. right now too because yeah they added yeah, and it, right it's going worldwide because other countries are like coming in and not this piece though this was from october yeah Correct. this is so this is terrain in october and um i was invited to take over the two front windows of the people's church in uptown so this is on the north side of chicago and um I was still really heavily grieving the loss of my mom. It was very unexpected. And the main thing I was doing was walking in the forest preserves because the trees were very comforting. And so I wanted to do something that had to do with the trees and like the literal trees that I was walking next to you because they were so comforting. And also I just wanted to express a lot of my ideas about family trees because within the same year of losing my mom, I also met my birth mom and- Erin, I love this. Yeah, and I also found my birth dad. So now I have three immediate families. And so this wow. is about- um, Branches. Being, yeah, branches and being connected and comfort. And the material that I used is all um, upholstery fabric. So it's all like from the couches of someone's living room sewn together to make something new and strange that's connected. And then um, the next slide was, it, that's the same, those are the same trees. And this is that Slack's window gallery. I really was grateful for the opportunity to install this twice because I feel like the first installation where they're absolutely busting out of the windows felt one way and the installation here where I spread them out more between two windows feels very much like a drawing to me 
and it's about the lines. And so I, I really enjoyed using the same installation two different ways because I, I feel like they're two very different expressions. Yeah, that is so lovely. And I love that, like you said, the difference between seeing, okay, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go really meta here. The difference oh, I between love that. Seeing, seeing them coming out of the building, because that was at the People's Church, correct? Right. On Lawrence. So I actually saw those driving by live last year. And oh. now I see them on the screen, but they're coming out and there's still something visceral about them coming out of that blocked off window space. And now they're behind glass, but they're also behind the screen and they're also showing that there's just all these layers to this family tree project. And I, I love that. Yeah. Thank you for sharing this one. Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. Where are these branches right now? Um, I kept, I think five. So I've got some in the corner of my studio, which when, when you scroll back, you'll probably see them like waving at you from one of the corners. And then um, one of them's gonna go to my aunt's house. I love that. And did yeah. you have, do you have a plan for those five to live somewhere else? Or are you wanting to install and continue that project? Um, no, I didn't want to keep installing it because um, I do I do a lot of work. And even though I just got on this big soapbox about how it's really not important to be productive right now, I'm, I tend to be very prolific and storage is a premium for me. Right. So I, I do like to show things a couple times, especially in different contexts. And then, um, then I need to move on to new projects new because project. I'm busting out of storage. So yeah. the five that I have might appear in another context somewhere. Yeah. I would say probably my bread and butter money and the main thing that I do are um, paper sculptures. And I do, I do a lot of work for myself. Um, I do work with the intention of showing them in galleries and I also do commissions. So one of the commissions that I had was for a perfume museum out in Berkeley. And I, I really enjoyed doing them because they were fun projects. So these are the two pieces. The first one is a musk deer and they were very fun to research. I actually went to the field museum and I'm like, musk deer, they're deer, but they have fangs and they're like chihuahua size. So like totally crazy, right? And they used to use the musk from that musk deer to make perfume. And so now they're not extinct, but they're endangered. And they don't, they don't use them for perfume anymore. They do it synthetically, but the museum wanted to show what a musk deer looks like. And of course she can't order a tax, a real taxidermy piece of a musk deer because you can't, you can't order an, an, an endangered animal. So she wanted me to make her one. And then the other one was the beaver and you can get real, a real beaver taxidermy, but she thought they looked too scary with their teeth and claws and wanted like a kinder, gentler, friendly beaver to welcome people to the museum, but still look fairly realistic. So um, that was a, a stylized one. So I didn't show the teeth and claws and uh, made it smile a little bit. And that was a really fun experiment too, because it was the first time I tried this. I used really, really chunky cotton mm -hmm. and imitated the fur. So, so uh, that was highly textured. And it got this amazing press. The museum did. And then it was like, they're like, hey, let's show the museum. And by the way, here are these sculptures by Aaron Kramer. And I'm like, holy cow, I'm in Vogue magazine and the Sun Times. The New the, York Times. The New York Times and um, Atlas Obscura was another one. Oh my God. That's all. Yeah. Awesome. And Vogue is like, she enlisted the help of vegan taxidermist Aaron Kramer. And I'm like, ah! That's so, <laughs> so can you, can you talk to us about how you came? I know this is, this is not recent work what I'm going to ask you is not recent work that you're doing, but can mm -hmm. you talk to us about how you came to this vegan taxidermy of making these animals out of handmade paper? But before you start that, I want to say that Andy Kramer said, as a historian, I'm impressed with the level of historical research you put into your work. So thank you for that comment, Andy. And then Leah says, wonderful example of science conservation and arts integration, which of course is Awesome. So can you, can you walk us through the past, go back in time and talk us through how you started making these wonderful crazy pants again, um, 
taxidermied but not real animals out of handmade paper and are they on wire forms that you create how how does this work and how did they find you this perfect perfume museum i have so many questions right now <laughs> so many questions um i learned how to make paper I took a, a cheap paper making day workshop with Sean Sheehy at Columbia College in 2005 and was immediately sold on this idea of paper. So really, if, if I were to sum up all, all of my art making in a sentence, it yeah, would be- Yeah, try to do that. Try um, to do that, Erin Kramer. I can. It's, um, my, my art is about transformation through ritual. So most of the work that I do is very labor intensive and old fashioned. And, you know, the art of paper making hasn't really changed at all, except I have a beater that has electric power, but that's the only thing. Otherwise, mm -hmm. paper making hasn't changed in like hundreds of years. Right. And Actually. I love, I love this idea of taking raw materials, raw plants, and the, the labor of transforming the plants into paper and then taking the paper and transforming that into sculpture. So paper has a memory. And if you put paper, the handmade paper on a surface or an object, it'll have a hydrogen bond and stick to it and then it'll dry to that form and then you can pop it off and it'll look like that form. Oh, awesome. And so that's what really fascinated me the most about paper making is that it, it has a memory. So then I went a little crazy and started doing all these animals. So some of some of the forms that I use are just straight up taxidermy forms. Some are things that I make, yeah. um, mostly out of foam. Okay. And some are things that I find, I buy a lot of like junk, type stuff at resale stores just because I like the the shape of the corner of this right or like you know I I borrowed my my cousin's little toy pig because I thought the shape of the ears on that would look better on the squirrel that I was making okay so I cast the ears on that and cast the squirrel out of foam and then put them together so right so a lot of these are are just put together yeah so this, um, these animals that are in the museum are actually quite light yeah. because they're just paper. Yeah, they're, they're super light. They will blow away. Okay. Um, and is this abaca that you're using? They're hollow. Yeah. Well, that's a good question. Um, so for, for paper making nerds, which is probably at least 50% of the people watching right now, if not more, um, the deer is flax. And... Yeah, I think the deer is all flax, and I painted it, and then um, there's some Kozo details on there. Okay. So sometimes I make flat sheets of paper and tear them up and add them just for details, so like the belly is lighter, so it's like a bleached Kozo. Gotcha. So it's a mix of different fibers that are... Yeah. And the, how long are you beating them? I mean, it um, depends on, of course, the Kozo difference, but, but, but how long are you throwing these into the right. beater? To make um, it about, an, about an hour. Oh, okay. So yeah. it doesn't it doesn't depend on how you want the skin to look. It just depends on the fiber that you're using, or it, it's um, really both. It's kind so, of so yeah. I I buy flax toe, so it's like super chunky, and um, I like the I like the texture of it because it imitates the short fur. I think really well. And then for the beaver, that was my new challenge because. Um, I wanted it to look really fuzzy and furry. Mm -hmm. So I, I cast the whole thing in a mixture of abaca and cotton. Mm -hmm. And then um, I took cotton and I mixed it with, um, oh, my mind's totally blanking. What is the glue that we use in paper making that's made out of the guts of okra? Is it the methyl cellulose? That you yes, methyl about? cellulose. Oh my God, it's so funny. I remember like the weird part, but not the name. Yeah. Right. I use methyl I'm, cellulose. I'm, you're going through all of the glues. I'm like, why rice for book I, Rice, <laughs> we use <laughs> methyl cellulose. With all the glues we make um, out of plants. CBA. Um, yeah, so I mix the, um, the methyl the cell. Cotton, 
with the methylcellulose and just make huge clumps. And then I took a fork. Oh, I like, yeah. So I slapped it on the forum and I, and I took a, um, a fork and made the fur. Oh my gosh. This is yeah. so fascinating. And I'm sorry to like focus so intently on this particular <laughs> thing. So are you ready to move forward? Let's move forward, friend. All right. So um, I do a lot of, these are, these are just trophies, but I also do full animals. So I like doing realistic vegan taxidermy. So I'm very influenced by the Field Museum and their old school big dioramas. And I think they're beautiful and they're also creepy. They are um, also creepy and they are quite stunning. And they are rather jarring because to look at them, you, you don't necessarily know they're not real. Right, and that's what I like. It's like, oh, it's very real, but then there's something a little bit off about them. Which is also charming and lovely and creepy. Yeah, yeah, which, um, which I'm always for. And so everything you're looking at now is life-size. Um, I went through this phase where I thought everything had to be life-size or like bigger than my body because I really like, I, I think scale produces an emotional reaction. Um, with yes. me, I think most of my audience. So I was working really big for a long time. I made an eight foot horse that was full size and we cast a Subaru station wagon. So we had a, a life size Subaru station wagon that was paper. And it was ridiculous because how were we gonna carry this thing around? We couldn't put it in the Subaru station wagon because it was the Subaru station wagon. So, right, right. So um, that's why I was crazy like the past 10 years or so. And now I'm like, okay, I'm gonna make Squirrels. Um, so I think that's the next slide, actually, Ken, if you want to move it to the next one. The squirrels are coming up. I, I think oh, the squirrels are. are. Yeah. So I have to show the squirrels. Um, those, are, those are kind of my bread and butter money and what I keep in my brick and mortar stores that sell art. And um, um, I'm, also, what, I'm also doing what little are the tails? animals. What, what are the tails made from? What, what um, fo it's faux fur that you can just oh. get from the fabric store. Yeah. Oh my gosh, they are just so crazy cute and weird. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, so. Oh, Leah fun. says she wants that for white squirrel. Leah just says she wants that white squirrel. Okay. <laughs> so you guys can connect if, if that's something you want to connect about. Leah, Leah's requesting the white squirrel. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the next slide, I think we changed these around a little bit. Um, so I'm not actually sure what it is. Oh, it is the mask still. So this isn't going on right now, of course, but um, I always try to have some kind of interactive element in my shows. Um, with the installations, I like to create environments for people and for gallery shows. If I'm showing a bunch of my sculptures, uh, I usually get permission to set masks out. And the masks are for sale, but I really encourage people to try them on and take pictures of each other. And I also have fiber boxes that are divided so you can, on one side, you can feel the raw fiber. And on the other side, I have a bunch of samples of paper that I've moved from that fiber. So as far as the process goes, you're really only seeing the very beginning and the very end. But I just want, I want people to be invited into my world as much as possible. Like basically my philosophy is, um, hey, I have this idea I'm really excited about and I want you to be in on it if yeah. you want to be. Yeah. So, um, I love that. That was my last studio visit was end of February. So that's my friend Ron with the horse head, and the middle one's actually Jen Thomas. Oh, who yay. Moved, yeah. Who moved far, far away? Um, and I think the the crazy kids. Ken said that one was kind of pixelated, so I don't know if you can make it out. But I think that was at the Bridgeport Art Center. But I usually put out things for people to try on and touch and check out. And it also helps people understand how light the stuff really is. And so like the bigger the piece, the more dangerous it is because it'll catch wind. And right. so one of these days I'm just gonna like blow away or something. Right. Um, right. So for the next slide, I put my blue star, some of the blue star creatures that I had made. So I made a whole series of these and they sold out, which I was really happy about because I'm really excited to make them. So these are all indigo, and I drew the constellations on them with the china marker. So I've already started making more of these, and now I'm trying to figure out, instead of drawing the 
constellations with the China marker. I'm trying to figure out how to do them with embroidery. Oh, so I'm using yeah. white embroidery thread because I think it pops a lot more and I like the feel of it. Um, embroidery on paper is very, very different than embroidery on fabric. Yeah. So it's totally unforgiving. Once you poke a hole, it's there forever. And if you poke too many holes, it'll tear out because it'll perforate itself. Right. So that's one of the challenges that I'm working on right now. So um, work in progress. I have another one of these crown hairs. Um, it's the full the full size hair that you see. Yeah. On are one these, side. So are the this is you said this is indigo. Are, what is yeah. the fiber that you're using? Um, it's a mixture of cotton and abaca. Okay. So most of most of the indigo I'm getting from bolts of uh, denim fiber. So it, it's from the bolt, so it already has the indigo dye in it. So okay. denim, of course, is what they make blue jeans out of, but this is like super dark. Mm -hmm. And then um, I don't, I would say most people who do paper sculpture swear by cotton and that's their go-to fiber, but I just don't think it's strong enough. Yeah, Abaca so, has that extra bit of, yeah. of hold. Too. Abaca has longer fibers, so it's stronger, so I just throw handfuls of it in with the cotton, so they're mixed. Well, I have more questions about these guys, but I want to oh, sure. jump to the chat real quick. Um, Ken says he wants one of these indigo animals, and so does Lisa Beth Robinson. She says, me too. All right. And I would like to also, remind him that he has one of my indigo animals in his dining room, but I can certainly yeah. make him over. <laughs> so maybe he wants to build his collection for Oh yeah, right on. For truth. So, um, and then Lisa Beth Robinson. I can't not say your full name, Lisa Beth Robinson. I have to say all three. It, it really um, has a nice, it has a nice it, flow to it. It's so got a good flow. Lisa Beth Robinson. I don't know if I know you, but we should be friends because you have a cool name and you know Jamie, so. Yeah, so um, it's the same way as I always say Aaron Kramer and I can't just say Aaron. <laughs> so uh, Lisa Beth Robinson's question is, would you consider yourself an environmental artist? And of course, says yes and agrees that you should be friends. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, an environmental, I'm an environmental artist by default. Um, of course, I think the environment is important, but that's not what I set out to do. That just happens to be what happened. So um, pretty much all of my art you can eat. You can eat, yes. <laughs> if you really want to. If you were starving and didn't make it to Costco. Yeah, or you just like, you really needed some extra fiber in your diet. Literal yeah. fiber. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I love these all, guys. These are I, all go ahead. recyclable. So I can, you really, they, they will withstand some water. Yeah. Because I've had so, things out in the rain quite often. Do you really have to soak the heck out of them? Yeah. Like preferably in really hot water overnight. And then they'll start breaking down and I can throw them back in the beater and turn the kitty into a bunny or like right. whatever. So what, I have a question about the, the sort of thematic element in these blue creatures, these awesome indigo guys. Why, what is the focus? Why are you combining the indigo color with the night sky? I understand that because duh. But why are you adding these constellation pieces? What's the what is the the inspiration behind these blue devils? <laughs> um, I love the the beautiful deep indigo color, and I love midnight blue in the sky. And these actually grew out of the installation piece that I did in 2018. That was all luminaries. Oh, okay. Um. So when I was doing the luminaries, I just started thinking about like outer space and how we're all connected and how we're connected spiritually to animals. And so that was the connection that I made. Um, and plus I love the indigo fiber. So, um, so it kind of matches. Yeah, most of oh, go ahead. My, my work is this weird combination of, oh my God, I totally, I totally overthink everything. And on the other hand, I totally wing it and it's intuitive. So it's like, super messed up but it seems to be working for me for the last 47 years so i think yeah. I'm gonna, yeah so <laughs> i just want to mention that i would love for you and leah to connect to talk about some some of the install uh constellation things because she's done series of constellation books um with oh, awesome. lit up things behind them but most most importantly umbrellas with the constellations poked out 
on the umbrella installations. Oh, very yeah. cool. So, so I just want to make that connection because I don't know if you are familiar with those pieces. No. Um, yeah. But then she also just dropped in a question. How has your approach to making and or the actual artwork changed slash been influenced by the pandemic? And I'm not entirely sure she caught the very, very beginning when you were talking a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. But um, do we have more slides or can we can we move to that? Um, I would like to I would like to show the next slide because I'm very excited about it. Okay. Oh, there we are. Um, <laughs> which face so this is this but is what I'm doing this question. And this minute. is what I'm doing right now. Animals with witches face. That. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like way obsessed with them. Is this um, from Rags to Witches? Um, no, but I think it should be. This is just for something that you're fascinated by, these really creepy, yeah, weird combination um, of animal witch things. So I don't um I don't want to ignore Leah's question. I guess my um my biggest answer is my I don't I don't know how my art making has changed exactly because um I, I can't analyze something when I'm in the middle of it, oh. but um, I would say if anything, I've been way less productive because this is this whole thing to me has been this great spiritual lesson in being present. And so to me, being present um, is really this balance of counting my blessings and grieving my losses simultaneously. And so sometimes I stay at home and eat all, I eat all the cheddar bunnies and that's all I do. Yeah. And, and that's an achievement for the day. And that's it. And yeah. And, and, and there's some days when I get really productive and, you know, organize all of my fabric by color. And for the most part, um, I've been trying new art just because I feel like it. And I've been making huge messes and none of it I would show to galleries or show to most people just because I'm just trying to work. I'm trying to work things out. Yeah. Um, so I think that's probably a reflection of my personal life is my art making. So um, there's, there's like big messes out in the other room. And it's just, it's really about being gentle with myself you know like we're out of cheddar bunnies and that's okay yeah taking and, care um, of this this not. quilt looks ridiculous and that's okay and sometimes um i'm right on the money and everything i measure works out and oh my god i can do math and that's okay so it's really about um being gentle yeah and this is what the witch-faced animals this is the only one i have so far because it's a prototype so i haven't started making new ones yet and this is what i was really obsessed with and they like late winter, early spring. So all the Ragdale people who are watching are like, yeah, I know she doesn't shut up about them. But <laughs> I think um, I think where these were going, like these pieces are really about fear and fear in the environment. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna stand by that statement. But I I want to add that they delight me, <laughs> and I get so happy when I talk about witch faced animals. So. So they make they they delight you. They're great, and then yeah, they're also about something that's really deep within all of us, especially right now. Right. Um, so I will I will very joyfully express pieces about fear. And so, then um, Ken says, this, turn them into witch-faced animal puppets. Oh my God! I know. It'll it'll be great. Um, and I want to make so this is. This one's relatively small. I think you can still see me in the corner so I can hold it up. It's like, yeah. it's yeah. this big yeah. and it's got this cool tail. But I really want to make like life-size deer with witch that. faces. So this is, a, this is just a crazy deer. deer. This is a fawn yeah. with a witch face. Yeah. Leah says, witches are a powerful feminist sim symbol of power also. Just yeah. slight aside. So is that the last slide? No, there's a million. Okay. Okay. Because I just want to be mindful of your time and everyone else's. We have about seven minutes till one. So we have a few Absolutely. more minutes. We can, we always go over slightly. So please just, just take care to, to finish it up. Oh, Joseph Laffey says, will they all be baby animal witches? <laughs> I think there should be a bunch of them for sure. A bunch of baby animals, so, a bunch of life size, everything. I love the that. Other, Joseph. The other, um, 
the other paper sculpture stuff I'm really into are um, that I'm still making are the uh, Fiji mermaids. So this is some of them. And Ken, if you can go to the next slide, it shows the little. So I'll, those are like three inches tall. They're super. They're super small. Except for the the big one is like ten. So um, I'm working yeah, on a series of little inches. Fiji mermaids. Okay. Um, just for a. Yeah, three inches tall. Wow. I've got my little yeah. ruler here and I'm looking at that. That's teeny tiny. What yeah. are these made from? Also fibers? Yeah, it's all it's all Abaca all the time. So you're sculpting these little little yeah. things? Okay, Lisa Beth Robinson. Love these. Best historical broadsides ever and excited to see them in the flesh. <laughs> yeah, so I think um I also like that Ringling actually were the people who started the Fiji mermaids because they were presenting them as real natural history when they used to charge people admission to like, come see the wonders of the world. And so I think that they're really fitting for this building that was built by For Ringling sure. That I'm sitting in. Um, okay, so let's move on because we're gonna talk about, let's talk about quilts. Um, so yay. I like, yay, this is Hannah, my quilting assistant. Very, She's very, 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 she look great. Very serious. Um, so I didn't know how to sew until about two years ago. And I just started getting like really, really obsessed with quilts. And I like art quilts and I like traditional ones. And I wasn't really sure what it was about, but I was just like, oh my gosh, you must learn how to sew. Sure. And, um, and I figured out like quilt making really has everything to do with my identity and and working out those kind of issues because in quilting I'm taking existing pieces of fabric from out there in the world and putting them putting them together in a way that makes sense to me so that ultimately I can create an object of comfort. I love that. So this has been a really strong theme for me. So sometimes I make quilts as gifts for people because I love them. And sometimes um, it's, they're about color studies and most of them are conceptual. So we can go through these slides, I think pretty quickly, Ken. Um, and we can do the next one. So these are just some samples of what I've been working on. And then the next one is more conceptual. So this, um, this concept has been my soapbox for a really long time, but it got really big in the last couple of years. Um, and it just has to do with when people find out that I was adopted, which is fine, it's not a secret, but they, they wanna ask me about my real mom or my real family. And I don't know what that means. Um, I don't know which mom they're referring to or which family or why they would say that because everyone is real. and. So I just, I've had such a big soapbox about that for such a long time that I wanted to be really passive aggressive about it and make a quilt. I love this. I love that idea. How big is this? I can see it on your shelf. Yeah. But what, how big are your shelves? Um, well, originally it was going to be 27 feet tall oh. by 20 feet wide. And then um, when I started learning how to quilt, I realized that everything needs to come in under 60 inches. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> or I might actually die. Um, right. This is about, um, I don't know, it's about four feet, maybe five feet tall. Are you hand quilting or are you doing it on a machine? No, I'm doing it on the machine. And then the next slide um, is another conceptual quilt that has to do with grieving. Oh. And, and just the weight, the, the weight of waiting. So yeah. there's kind of a trick words and spelling there. Um, yeah. I just felt really consumed by waiting and I didn't know what I was waiting for or why. And so I just really wanted to make a quilt about it. And then I don't think you can see it, but the detail of it, um, the way that I quilted it is in the shape of an hourglass. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. And then the next one is what I'm working on right now. And if you, yeah, that's, it's actually, I, I'm more long than what it's showing because I put the big blue borders on it. So this one's going to come in at 65 by 55. And this one I'm making for somebody. And those flying geese, it's the same exact thing that I used for the Evanston installation. It's the same quilting block. 
but the Evanston installation, those geese are like, you know, 20 inches. And in the picture that you're looking at, these are four inches, so. <laughs> so they're smaller, for sure. Yeah. And yeah. then there's Hannah helping out. Yeah, Hannah's always there helping. Um, and I think, the, so there's just two more things that I wanna fit in, and I can do it quickly. Um, yeah. And if you can throw the next one is flying creatures. So apparently I didn't, I didn't put in good pictures because I copied them funny from the internet, but um, this was this really big project that I did for Chicago land. I worked with schools, middle school kids and high school kids. And so the concept of this is flying creatures. So each kid or a group of kids makes a creature um, specific to a kit that I put together. And then we hung them in downtown Chicago on Wabash Avenue along the L track. So um, it's like right behind Marshall Fields, which I know is Macy's, but I will forever call it Marshall Fields. Of course. Um, so they're close to the L. So we got, um, there's about two city blocks. How many of these total were hanging? I don't remember. Um, How many this, was in 20, this was in 2018, which isn't really that long ago, but um, I think I had like, there are four or five schools up right now. Yeah. Fair. And um, I did this through DKs. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Susan yeah. Frank. Yeah. Great. Yeah. All right. And then uh, the last thing is rags to witches, which I have to show because that's there what I've been doing for Halloween the last four years. And, and so this falls under big, big group projects. That's really important to me. So everything's a collaboration. And I do a lot. You can see. Um, the prairie spirits are creatures that I came up with. I kind of think of them as live sculptures. And so I did the masks for them and Daisy Palma designed the costumes and awesome. the banjo the banjo players, the big kitty, and uh, me and a group of friends did the all the tombstones. So those are actually plywood. We just painted them. Mm -hmm. And I think there's I think there's one more slide of regs to witches, but I did put the uh, Yeah, there we go. The and website. The web, yeah, the website I just dropped, I dropped it Ooh. twice now, I, I guess, into the... Oh, great. Yeah. If you go, um, Ken Gurley put together this great website for us last year, so. Yeah. Last year was year four, so this, this year will be year five, but I don't know what we're doing yet. Cool. So I have a few questions in the chat to ask you. And oh, sure. So Andy Kramer says, absolutely agreed, Leah, about the comment about witches. Feminine power connects all the way back to pre-Christian pagan rituals. And then Joseph Lappy says, Eric Wolfmeyer is a great art quilter in Iowa City. So you should check oh, that cool. out. Some amazing stuff. And then Leah says, from where do you receive feedback, peer support, or critique? Where are you getting your um, critiques and peer, peer comments and stuff right now since you are... A working artist in the world. Is that question like post grad school or in or the middle like of now, I lockdown? Think, I think in it's the middle of, of lockdown. I think for Leah, and I'm I'm just gonna guess it's kind of both. So, okay. um, but primarily like right now in lockdown, maybe Leah, can you clarify? Do you mean post post grad school during normal times or during lockdown times? Both post grad school. Um, and quarantine. Okay, so two sure. different, two separate ideas there. Thank you, Leah. Mm -hmm. Sure, those are those are great questions. So um, I have I have a pretty big artist network that um, the core people I know from grad school, but I'm always adding people um, when I'm out and about in the world, and I'm like, oh, I I like you, and I like your work, and we should work together. I love collaborating. So um, my my group gets bigger. It gets bigger and bigger as, um, again, you know, it's like, hey, I have this idea and I want you to be in on it. And I want you to add your own thing and make it even bigger. And then we'll invite more people. Um, and during, during lockdown, I've suddenly become a phone person. So I'm actually more social now than I normally am because I'm um, calling and texting a lot of people. <laughs> Where normally I'm like, oh, I'm busy. And now I'm like, so, what are you doing? Exactly. So, so mostly text and, and talking yeah. stuff like this. Yeah. 
and there's been a lot of texting back and forth of like, oh, I love this artist, or hey, what do you think about this color together? And, right, right. Yeah. Or, oh my God, I want to change my whole entire project idea for Evanston Art Connects. Can I do that? Yes. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I did. Yeah. <laughs> Jamie, actually, yeah, actually, that's great. Erin, thank you so much. I am thank you for joining us for Erin Kramer's Quarantour, brought to you by Artist Bookhouse. We hope you enjoyed visiting Erin's studio in the Dole Mansion in Crystal Lake, Illinois, and we look forward to next week with Lucy Baxendahl in Great Britain. Please join us. If you would like to support more programming like this from Artist Bookhouse, please visit artistbookhouse.org slash donate. Thank you so much. Every single bit helps.